Als nächstes will we'll start doing P4 beef, beef again. I saw this one. TK and just let me take October, November 2022 and and five two. So this one is, the first thing is that what is the position? Uh, so there's, there's eggs and they contain calcium carbonate. TK, that's the question. Student wants to find out what percentage of an eggshell is calcium carbonate and uses the following method. The method uses a known excess of acid to dissolve the eggshell. The amount of unreacted acid is then determined by titration with an alkali, assuming the acid only reacts with calcium carbonate in the eggshell. So he washes the eggshell with distilled water, warms the eggshell in an oven until it's dry, crushes it, turns it into powder, weighs about two grams of uh, uh, eggshell in a conical flask using, using a balance which measures up to three decimal places, uh, adds uh, hydrochloric acid, I think, in excess, loosely over the conical flask and leaves for two days, filters the content of the conical flask with, without any rinsing, or with any rinsing into a 250. So he, he dissolves the egg and adds it to a two and makes a 250 cm cube solution. And then he takes 25 cm cube and then I think he titrates it with NaOH. So that's what's happening. And over here, I think it's uh, the egg has calcium carbonate. So that calcium carbonate would react with HCl and it will form what? It will form calcium chloride. plus water plus carbon dioxide. Now, uh, suggest how the student can confirm the eggshell is completely dry in step two. So how could you ensure in step number two that the eggshell is completely dry? What's the method of figuring that out experimentally? Anyone, what, what are you going to do if, if you want to ensure that it's completely dry? Reweight, uh, Re check the weight once again. Tigers, that's called, that's called heating till. That's called heating till constant mass, which basically means uh, you constantly reweight. Re And, and check the, if the mass is constant. If it's constant, that means there's no more water and there's no more water evaporating. And that's why the mass remains exactly constant. State why the eggshell is made into a powder in step three before making it. So how, why, do you, why do you crush it into and make it into a powder? Why do you do that? To increase the surface area so the reaction happens faster. Okay, that's it. So that's got to do with surface area. So the reaction happens quickly. Uh, suggest why the solution is left for two days in step six before being used. Why, why do you leave it for two days? I mean, that's just to ensure that the reaction is complete, right? That's it. So that all the eggshell has dissolved. That's part three. He does the titration now. So the eggshell has uh, dissolved and uh, obtains the results shown. So the student uses exactly 2.136 grams of powdered eggshell. Uh, the titrations are done and the mean titers. So which, which two titers are, I mean, we have to first figure out. This is the first one is 16.55. What is the next one? What is experiment number one? It's going to be 16.3. So that's 16.3, right till two decimal places. What about uh, the next one? That's 16.00, right? Yes. And that's uh, what, 16.20, I think? 
Yes. I says the best titration results are the ones that are point have a difference of point one. So I guess that's going to be sixteen point two and sixteen point three, and your mean would come out to be sixteen point. It's going to come out to be sixteen point two five. He then calculates the amount in moles of unreacted HCl in the solution prepared in step seven. Show your working. Uh, so once the eggshell had dissolved in the acid, there was unreacted HCl. So calculate the amount in moles of unreacted HCl. So first thing is we can calculate the moles of NOH, right? That are being titrated over here. So moles of NOH will be, we know the titration uh, that's concentration times volume. We know the volume that's 16.25. The concentration was somewhere, I mean, probably given somewhere. Yes, it's it's one mole per, it's one mole per decimeter cube. So this one is one mole per decimeter cube times 16.25 divided by 100. What, what do we get for this? 0 0.01625. And since the acid and the NOH are 1 ratio 1, so that's going to be 0 0.1625, I think. 1 ratio 1. Yeah, 0 0.01625. Okay, so we figured this out that... Uh, NOH was 0 0.01625. So HCl will be exactly the exactly the same. Uh, so he's he wants us to calculate the moles of unreacted HCl, but I think that's not the answer because that's the moles of HCl in just 25 cm cube, right? Because only you ended up making a 250 cm cube solution. You actually had a 250 cm cube solution. And from that 250 cm cube solution, you took 25 cm cube. So the titration only involves, it only involves 25 cm cube. So what you have to do now is you have to multiply by 10 as well, because your original solution is going to have 10 times the moles than the ones that are used in the reaction. So. So I think that's going to be multiplied by 10. So it's going to be 0 0.16. Yes. Is this clear? Hey, can you repeat it again? You see the whole reaction, the titration part, that was only happening with, I mean, he just did titration right at, in step number eight, right? So it was only happening with 25 cm cube solution, right? Yes. So the moles that you calculated, you just did give the answer. That was for 25 cm cube. The original solution that you actually made oh. was 250 cm cube. So in 250 cm cube, the moles are going to be 10 times the ones present in step number eight, right? Okay. So calculate the amount of moles of calcium carbonate that react with the excess of the acid. Uh, so these are your unreacted, right? So we need to go back 0.1625, right? So 0.1625 are unreacted. How many moles were actually added? That's step number five. So how many, how many moles were added in step number five? Two into 100 divided by 1,000. So it's going to be 0.2 moles, right? Uh, it's going to be as yes, open to. So you added 0 0.2, but this 0 0.1625, that's unreacted. So that means what? We get 0 0.0375 as uh, reacted. 0 point? 0 0.0375. Repeat? So that's the most that reacted, right? So 
so point zero three seven five moles are the ones that actually took part in the reaction. So, um, and calcium carbonate in HCl ratio was was two ratio one in the equation. So if this is point zero three seven five, then the moles of calcium carbonate would be half of that. What's what's half of that? 0 0.01875. And you can multiply it by the MR to find the mass, which is uh, calcium is, I think, MR would be 100.1. Uh, MR, MR is 100.1. Yes. So that gives you how many grams? One point eight seven six. As that gives you one point eight seven six grams. Now one point eight, seven, six grams. What was the original mass that he used? I think he used two grams of the eggshell, right? So we can figure out the percentage now. It's uh, so it's 1.876 grams out of the two grams of eggshell that we had. So what is the percentage that we're getting? Ninety-three point, ninety-three point eight. Yeah. So for percent for percentages to be like for two decimal places or one decimal place or like three significant figures. It's usually three significant figures, but here's the here's the rule. The simple rule is that uh, you're gonna follow. I mean, what is this? This is four significant figures, right? Yes. Uh, what is this? This is also four significant figures. So most of the data that's given over here, this one over here, that's four significant figures as well. Uh, the mass, the original mass was actually just two grams. But generally the rule is that uh, you go for either three significant figures or the minimum significant figures that are mentioned in the question. So it's, it's all right if you go for three significant figures. Uh, name a student, generally speaking, three significant figures is an accepted practice. It's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, less than three, that becomes too, uh, too rounded off a value. Like if you round it off to one significant figure, that's going to be nine, 90%. So that will have a big error. Now, name a suitable piece of apparatus which could be used to transfer 25 cm cube. How do you transfer a solution in a buret into, sorry, not a buret, but into a conical flask? A pipette? Yeah, that's the prepared. Number four, a conical flask is weighed using a balance uh, accurate to three decimal places and the mass recorded. The actual is placed in the conical flask and the mass increases by 2.136. Calculate the percentage error in measuring the mass of the actual. Show you're working. First thing, what is the minimum graduation in this? Remember, the error is always going to be the minimum graduation divided by So it's the minimum graduation divided by two. So the minimum graduation that you have over here is 0 0.001. And that's going to be divided by divided by two. That's your error. You can remember the error in any reading is that if this is the this is the graduation, then the error is half a graduation. I mean, if if this is the value that you're talking about, the error in that value is half a graduation up and half a graduation down. So this value represents any values that lie within this within this range. So it's plus minus the minimum graduation divided by two. So over here it's going to be 0 0.001 divided by divided by two. 
and so that, so that graduation is of conical flask this one second as so it's it's minimum graduation divided by 2 not of the conical flask is talking about measuring the mass so it's it's the weighing balance right is that clear okay sir. so that's the error but then there's another question which is that uh, what happens if you add or subtract two values what happens to the error the error always gets added up so whenever you add or subtract two values the error gets added up and when you're weighing something it's always you're always taking a difference for example if you like over here is saying the actual is placed in a conical flask the mass increases by 2.136 so how did he do that he must have taken uh, the mass of the conical flask and then he must have added the substance and the mass of the conical flask had increased how did he know that it increased he took a difference so when you take a difference the errors will get added up so your error which is in this at the moment in every single value that's 0.00 0.05 is going to double because you're subtracting value so your error now is actually 0.001 is this part clear Sir, could you repeat it again, please? I mean, if you, if you remember, do you remember physics that what happens to errors when uh, values get added or subtracted? Yes, a little. The, yes. The errors they always get added up. So, how did you measure the mass? What you must have done was that you, there was a there was mass of the conical flask. Uh, let's say the mass was hypothetically speaking twenty grams, right? And then there was the mass of the conical flask plus the mass of uh, what are we trying to measure by the the actual? So the so how did you calculate the mass increase by two point one three six? You probably took a different side. Is this clear? Yes. Oh yeah. So two point one three six. So since you're actually taking a difference. when you were taking a difference the error the first one the first value had an error of plus minus 0.05 and the second one also had the same error so your final value is going to have an error of 0.001 the errors are going to get added up is that clear yes now the next part is uh, you have to find the percentage error and remember when you whenever you're trying to measure the mass the the error gets doubled because you're always going to take a difference when you do that so since your error is now 0.01 and the actual value is 2.136 you're going to multiply that by 100 and that's going to be your percentage error is the error divided by the divided by the actual value So what do we what do we get for this? Zero point zero four six eight. I mean that's that's the percentage error, right? Yeah. T 
ठीक है दैट्स आई गेस यू कॉट अ वेरी लो परसेज एरर एंड देन द स्टूडेंट रिपीट्स द मेथड using the same apparatus but decides to use 0.100 mol per dm cube whenever to reduce the risk of corrosion or damage to eyes explain how this introduces a weakness to the experiment so so over here what he's doing is that he has changed the concentration of anyways what was the concentration of anyways that he was using using previously i think 2 i mean let me go back to step number 8 so no he was using He was using one mole per dm cube, right? Yeah. So previously he was using one mole per dm cube over here. This now he's using point one mole per dm cube. So can you tell me what is the weakness that's going to be introduced to the experimental procedure? You've reduced the concentration ten times. like if you if you reduce the concentration 10 times what would happen to the volume that is needed now of any which i mean if you if you're using a very dilute solution right the amount or the volume that is needed now is going to be 10 times more is that is that part clear okay yes sir why i don't understand Hey, see if you if you have a concentrated solution, right? I mean, you get the idea, right? That if you have a concentrated solution, less volume is needed, right? Because it's more concentrated. It's got more, it's got more particles, right? Uh, do you do, do you okay. understand? The, so if you yes. if you dilute a solution, then obviously a larger volume is needed for the same number of moles, right? Okay. So the problem is that previously during titration, the volume of anyways that was required was what sixteen point two five cm cube, right? But if you dilute it ten times, the volume required will go up by ten times as well. So now you would need one sixty two point five cm cube. Okay. And that's a problem because a beer maximum capacity is fifty cm cube. so you don't have burets that have a that could cater to 162.5 cm cube so that is what the weakness is going to be in the experimental procedure so the volume and concentration is inversely proportional ha huh, that's inversely proportional like like if i if i have a solution right i mean i can show you like if i have a solution and that solution has a six particles right and then you've got another solution that has six particles so more concentrated solution will have a smaller volume a less concentrated solution is going to have a is going to have a large larger volume right is that clear yes sir and my moles is concentration times volume so so if higher concentration lesser volume if it's lower concentration the volume goes up they are inversely proportional I so said that's the only. It's one more question. That's your only weakness in the experimental procedure. So I think we left one question now. Questions E. Which one? Question E. I said state the effect on the person if mass of the action is not completely dried. In step two, explain the effect on the person by mass. Uh. So if. Uh, the effect on the passage by mass is not completely dried so you'll have the same what will happen then is i mean this is the only difference that's going to happen if the egg is not this was the mass of the egg so if the egg was not completely dry this would that would give you a bigger value i mean this 2 gram will come out to be actually a bigger value right your egg is going to weigh a bit more so what will happen to the percentage it's going to be it's going to be lower right is that clear i mean this was the this was the mass of the egg right 
So if the egg is not completely dry, that means you'll be measuring an incorrect value of the mass of the egg, and that value is going to be higher. It's going to be bigger. Okay, is this part clear? Yes, sir. So it means there is less chance of getting error. Hey, not about the error. It's you've already got an error, an error. If if the egg is not dry, there's going to be some water in it. So maybe the mass comes out to be two point two zero grams for the egg. So the problem is that you'll be weighing the egg incorrectly. So if you divide, if you do the same calculation, you will get a lower percentage of. So it's not about the error; it's about what percentage are you going to get the composition of calcium carbonate. Okay, so you you you're measuring the egg incorrectly. So you just change that value, change it to a bigger value, and you'll get a lower percentage composition. Okay, is this clear? Yes. Yes, and so for F, uh, the error would be because the, the apparatus used only measures into 25 centimeter cubed? 50. 50? Okay. Yeah, Buret, Buret only measures 50 cm cubed. So how, and I told you that the volume goes up 10 times. So mm -hmm. that okay. will be out of the range of the capacity of the apparatus. So do we have to write in clearly like uh, if volume, if concentration decreases, then volume increases? So it's, a, it's, just a, it's just a one mark question. So I guess um, you're just going to state that you have a dilute solution. So more volume is needed, which will exceed the capacity of the apparatus of the burette. I said next one, there's a it is possible to measure the rate at which the potassium magnet diffuses through a permeable gel using the following method. So I think this is, he's talking about diffusion. So this is your potassium magnet. And I guess it will start diffusing in the Petri, gel, Petri dish in a gel. So it's prepared with a permeable gel, a hole of diameter 0.5 is cut into the center of the permeable gel, a sample of chemo 4 is placed into the hole. And the same time a stopwatch is started after three minutes, the diameter of the colored spot is measured. So it will start spreading. So the, so the color will start spreading and he measures the diameter, right? So it starts spreading in all directions. So after three minutes, he stops the stopwatch and measures how far has the gel spread through the, how far has the chemo 4 spread through the gel? So that diameter is measured every three minutes and the student obtained the results. So basically it's, so diameter increase of the colored spot, diameter of the colored spot. And, um, and this is the difference, like how is the diameter increasing every second? So every second the diameter increases at a certain point it stops increasing. So that's when the diffusion is complete. You're going to plot the results of this on this chart. And I'll, I'll roughly try and do this. Um, uh, what, what do I need to plot? Di the increase in diameter. So, so I need to plot this column, the increase in diameter with respect to time. So at zero, it's zero. At uh, 0 0.6, it's three. So, so at 0 0.6, 0 0.6 is, is this one. I just, so at 0 0.6, it's three. No, sorry, at three, it was 0.6. At three minutes, it was 0.6. I just so at three, three, three is, this, is the same one. That's three. So at three, it's uh, point 0.6. So that's, uh, I think that's this one. Uh, anyways, you can you can try and plot uh, all the values accurately, and I guess it's basically going to go 
the diameter will continue to increase and then it will at a certain point it will it will stop increasing the diameter stops increasing at a certain point around the 30 30 minute mark so you're going to plot all the points and uh, at a certain point it will stop increasing that's how the graph would look like you can plot the points yourselves on the graph circle the point which you believe to be the most anomalous so so your graph is going to have a lot of points that would be or maybe a few points that would be away from the sketch so you're going to think of a reason of why that point is anomalous so for example if this point if this is arbitrary i mean just hypothetically speaking if this is the point that's anomalous it's very far away from the line so what's what happened what went wrong over here what went wrong over here is that maybe you measure the time incorrectly maybe you were i mean this point must have been to the left and you actually calculated the time incorrectly and uh, so it was measured at an incorrect time or there was a delay in uh, there was a there was a delay in the time interval or you measured too quickly before the actual time had been reached so the time you can you can comment on the error on the on the x axis is that clear yes and then you have draw a suitable tangent to the line at time t you've calculated the gradient of your tangent uh, so i guess you should be able to figure out what the gradient is at 15 minutes so remember this is a rough graph so at 15 graph make a tangent and make it as big as possible okay so with a ruler and try to have try to try to make it as big as possible and then try and measure the gradient which would be an increase in y over an increase in over an increase in x sir tangent graph pe kahin bhi bana sakte hai na no? nahi 15 minutes ka tha na usse oh okay theek hai so you have to i mean the point should be touching the line at 15 minutes exactly i mean this is wrong it's i mean this is this should be the point it should only be touching the graph at 15 minutes so while making the graph it should be in best fit line yeah tangent is always a straight line no i mean like uh, like while pointing and making a hand sketch graph uh nee the graph did he mention a straight line i think plot a graph on the grid to show nee the graph i mean that you have to judge according to how the graph looks like whether it's a straight line or whether it's not a straight line it says like draw a line of best fit it if it says a line of best fit it could be a curve as well normally it's a it's a curve okay but the points will give you an idea whether it's a straight line or whether it's not a straight line i don't think this one is a straight line like look at the points over here it's uh it's it's increasing and then it stops increasing right so i don't think that looks like a straight line okay that's probably a curve if you plot the points i mean by just looking at it you would know that it's it's a curve or it's not a curve like uh, while making a while joining the points if it comes a, a curve then you have to you have to sketch it with with your free hand and you have to ensure that the points are very close to that line that you are drawing and almost equal number of points are above and below the line okay as a next one select the appropriate data from the table to calculate the average rate of diffusion so that we can do average rate of diffusion so so i can average means the total right so how much did the spot diffuse it went from 0 to 3.6 cm so the total distance travel is 3.6 cm in what is the total time that it took for it to travel that's uh, 36 minutes so 3.6 cm traveled in 36 minutes uh what would that come out to be that's going to be 0.1 right yes okay so i guess that's uh that's 
Also then suggest how the experiment could be made more reliable. So how can you ensure that your experiment is good enough? Uh, whether they are reliable means how can you ensure that the results that you obtained are the right one? They did not have any error in them. So for reliability, if you want to increase reliability, what do you what do you need to do? Repeat the experiment and take an average. Okay, so you repeat the experiment. Uh, so that's that's one way. Uh, repeat the experiment and see if you still get the same line. If you do get the same line, then that's a res reliable result. So repeat the experiment several times and take the average. That's also going to going to give you reliable results. So what's the answer for E? Think we it. Identify the independent variable in the experiment. Independent is the one that you control, that's time. The x-axis is your independent variable, that's time. Okay. Uh, the diameter, the distance travel, that's dependent on that. Now the last few parts are that another component of potassium, which is colored, is potassium dichromate 6. It's got an MR of 294. The compound is corrosive and aqueous. It is possible to use the method described earlier to determine the rate of diffusion of K2Cr207. Uh, predict how the graph obtained would differ from that of uh, KM04. So, so K2Cr207, MR is 194. For KM04, what was the MR for KM04? Did he mention it somewhere? Yeah, the MR is 158. So who diffuses faster, smaller or heavier, lighter or heavier? Lighter MR diffuses faster. TK, that's the only dif difference, TK. Your graph, uh, more distance travel, right? Uh, so if it's, if it's 294, how will the graph uh, change? Uh, the graph is going to be higher. I mean, that's one. Uh, I mean, not higher, 294 is heavier. So it's going to be, it's going to be less distance traveled. So it will diffuse slowly. It's going to take a longer, longer time. Uh, I guess that's, that's about it. And I think one mark would be for the reason for that. So you're going to talk about the greater MR having slower particles. Now, apart from temperature state, one variable which must be controlled when comparing the rate of diffusion. So what is the other variable that needs to be controlled when you are comparing diffusion? I mean, the experiment, there would be a lot of control variables. What the volume of the dye used? Would that be? Will that affect diffusion or the speed of diffusion? For example, if you, if there's a perfume, if somebody is spraying perfume in mm -hmm. one corner of the room, would it affect the time it takes for the perfume to diffuse through the room if somebody had sprayed a larger amount of perfume or if somebody had sprayed a smaller amount of perfume? I mean, would no, they, would, I don't think so. It won't, you, you'll just get more perfume at the other end. Mm -hmm. But the time taken for the particles to travel across the room, that would pretty much still be the same, right? So, so I don't think diffusion is, or the speed or the rate of diffusion is dependent on, uh, on, on the number of particles you have, right? Um, it's just that you're going to get more particles at the other end, but otherwise... I don't think that would be, that needs to be controlled as such. So what could be the other thing? Uh, the other thing is it's, uh, it's, he's saying aqueous, right? So that means you need a solution for, for diffusion to happen in. So that's the other thing, the solvent or the solution, uh, that has to be, I mean, that has to be the same. Is that clear?
No, we have to use a solution because it's aqueous. I mean, seeing it's aqueous, right? Yeah. So it has to be the same solution with okay. pretty much the same concentration. Yeah, that's one thing. So it has to be the same solution that's going to be used. Other than waiting eye protection, state one uh, student should take if they were to use potassium dichromate six. So he did mention it somewhere over here that, uh, what did he mention? It's corrosive when, when aqueous. So corrosive things, what do you need to do? Wear chemically resistant gloves. Tiga, so that's uh, you're gonna wear gloves for that. Um, another student suggests that to compare the rate of diffusion, it would be easier to place solid crystals of each of these compounds into the holes in two petri dishes. Says to another student suggests that to compare the rates of diffusion, it would be easier to place solid crystals of each of these compounds. So instead of aqueous, right? So what are the practical problems when you place solid crystals? You must like dissolve. Yeah, the solid, uh, if it doesn't dissolve, it won't travel anywhere. So no diffusion would happen, right? If the solids are, uh, don't dissolve in the gel or what else could happen? If you use a solid, I mean, solids, uh, diffusion is faster for gases. It's faster for liquids as well. Relatively spe speaking, it's still slower compared to gases, but for solids, it's, uh, it's very slow. So solid particles will take a very, very long time for, diffusion to happen. So either they're not going to dissolve in the gel uh, and they won't pass through the gel or they would be, I mean, the whole process would be very, very slow. Is that clear? Yes. See. Yeah. What he did was that there was, there was this gel. I mean, this is what he did. Where's the he had a gel, uh, so it, I think it was a semi-solid gel-like substance, like maybe some wax-like thing. He, he drilled a hole over there, and that's where he put the solution of K two Cr two O seven and K N O four. And then he waited for the for the solutions to to diffuse into the gel. So that is what he meant by the by the drilling the holes into the into the gel. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Tiger, tomorrow we'll we'll do this paper is done. So tomorrow we'll try and do P4 then. Tiger will be back to P4. There which uh, exam will we do so I can uh, print it? We can try. I'm going to write it over here. One second. I said we have still not completed the previous ones as well. well we can try this one just a second. So let's try W20 question paper 4.1. And just let me. Question paper 4. This one. All right. Sorry. Okay, then take care. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir. Office.